Okay, great. So we uh, we are starting our Just Transition Subcommittee meeting for October 21st, and um, I have dropped the agenda in the chat box if people want easy access to that. And we're just going to start off with um, uh, welcome. And I think as we've been doing the past few meetings, um, if people want to use the chat box to just introduce themselves, that'd be great. And I would invite both subcommittee members and public members here today, if they want to do that, to introduce themselves, to say who's in the room. I think that's appropriate. And if you feel so inclined as to share, um, my favorite thing is to share something you're feeling grateful for. I'm a big fan and believer in, in the practice of gratitude and cultivating that. So I would invite everyone, if you're feeling so inclined, to share a gratitude as well. Um, and I'll just start by saying that I am uh, immensely grateful for, uh, you can't see it, but every day when I'm at home commuting, I look outside my window at the barn that my uh, partner has been building all summer. And uh, we achieved our goal of getting the full structure up. It doesn't have any doors or windows or walls, but the structure itself made itself up. And I feel like the warm weather this fall, today was the day when that sort of final rafter went on the roof. So that's my great and gratitude today. Um, great. So with that, I will ask um, subcommittee members to uh, we have our agenda, so our agenda today is we're going to start with some general updates. We've been pushing that to the end of the meeting, but there's actually a lot happening, so we thought general updates um, could be helpful at the start. Um, hoping, Jane, that you're still prepared to just in two or three minutes, or David, either one, I don't care, to walk through um, the decision-making process, the sort of the steps that are happening right now of prioritization, and, and then um, what happens then, and then decisions, and then um, the, the plan itself. Just recognizing that members of our subcommittee aren't um, necessarily all sitting in on those weekly climate council meetings and might not be up to speed on sort of the process itself, and I think that could be really helpful. And then with that, we're going to switch to uh, Kaya, our equity consultant, who's going to give us an update on her work with um, with the subcommittees as they start to use the rubric and the assessment questions. And, and hopefully out of that, we'll gain some great insights that are going to lead us into this conversation around just transitions and equity considerations and implementation, right, which is a section of the plan that our subcommittee is tasked with. We started to have a conversation on last time, and our goal today is to try to, um, to come back to that, what exactly sort of is next. Um, and what does, needs to be named in the plan. Um, then we'll have some time for public comment, maybe a little bit of time. I think the group that is testifying tomorrow in the um, with the legislative committee is, is even poised to perhaps touch base after the meeting tonight, but um, a little bit of time to just touch base on coordination and then other business. So that's our agenda for tonight. And any questions, considerations, concerns? Okay, hearing none, I will consider that agenda adopted for tonight. And then we need approval of our minutes from the last meeting. So those are linked in the agenda. And um, hopefully folks had a time to look at those. Any questions, concerns, thoughts? If you, if you didn't have time to look at them, happy to postpone approving those. I recognize that I often send out the agenda on Tuesday when it's posted, and I just as sort of a reminder to our subcommittee, I didn't do that until this morning. So I recognize some people may not have had time to look at the minutes. Anyone? Okay. So hearing no concerns then, or no one saying I haven't had time to look at them, I'm assuming then that we're good to move forward with approving the minutes. Okay, great. Then we're gonna just jump in. We're gonna jump into, um, look at that, we caught up. We're ahead of schedule. When does that ever happen? Okay, 
So the next thing on our agenda is to just do some general updates. So folks who are participating in the steering committee, in subcommittee meetings, um, in the full council, um, just want to provide an opportunity for people to provide some general updates to this subcommittee about the work that's going on, things that you think we should be aware of. So anyone want to jump into that? This is where I might invite, like, I, I, um, I also know Kelly is not able to make it today, and I don't say Chris, which is unusual. So usually we have Kelly, Chris, Iris, I know Sue's traveling. Um, but if Iris or Sue want to jump in with updates just from the council meeting on um, the last couple of weeks, that might be great for the group. Anything? What, what are you guys doing? You're all just slacking off when you hang out on Tuesday on Zoom, Iris? Any, any sort of just big highlights that you could share with us? I actually missed the beginning of last week's meeting, so I'm deferring yeah. to see who are you. Okay. And here comes Chris. It feels cruel to put him on the spot right away, but for Jane, even Jane or David, if one of you could just maybe provide a high level of sort of the work that the Climate Council did has done the past couple of weeks, that would be great. Sure, I'm happy to, or are you, David, happy to defer to you? I'll just say a few words. The council's getting into the thick of it, right? So the council is receiving things from uh, from the steering committee, excuse me, from the subcommittees um, and reviewing that. Although this week, what we did is we took a deep dive into the public um, engagement work that you all looked at um, previously, the work from the consultants and, and had a conversation about that. and. You know, there's a lot of enthusiasm about the amount of work that's being done and a lot of concern that, boy, there's a lot more engagement that needs to happen around this. And so what's that, what should that look like after December 1st? So that was this week in the council and starting next week, the council is going to be really diving into what's coming out of these other subcommittees, whether it's rural resilience, ag and ecosystem and cross-sector mitigation. So it's, we're getting into the final hurrah here towards the December 1st deadline. Um, and that's in the council creates some anxiety about the speed of all this work and also some enthusiasm to like, yep, let's get into it. Let's do this. And then we know there's a lot more to work that needs to happen after December 1st. Great. Thank you. I just feel like that's really important context for the rest of us who aren't necessarily able to sit, sit in on all those meetings. So. Any questions for David about sort of the general work of the council? And also just want to welcome Chris just joined us. So Chris, if you had anything you wanted to add to that, feel free. Um, yeah, I mean, from the perspective for this committee, um, I mean, there's a lot of drafting going on right now. I don't, I don't, know, if, I don't know what was discussed before I got on, but uh, um, there's a lot of writing going on right now. Um, and while there's been a lot of discussion about policies and proposals within the subcommittee, the council, of course, has not really started getting into this yet or, we, or we're on the, the fringes. And so one of the things I, I would suggest the subcommittee do is, um, you know, be mindful, speak up. Uh, I mean, I, and as a member, I'll, I'll do this too. Um, even as I'm one of the people drafting some of this stuff, uh, that we've got to keep the equity lens, we've got to keep the just transitions principles on the table because um, you know, what I was a little afraid about of might happen, you know, we're trying to squeeze so much into such a short time period. And you know, it's not by any kind of evil designer. It's kind of one of those it is what it is situations. Um, we're just gonna to have to make sure that the just transitions principles are given their given their uh, their due. Um, and honestly, some of that, you know, it needs to happen in this drafting now and in the policy deliberations that are going to be happening over the uh, coming weeks. Um, but honestly, some of it's probably going to have to happen even after the, uh, the, the, the initial climate action plan is drafted. Um, I, I, I see some not some, is that nodding or sh is that shaking, right? This is nodding, is that right? I'm seeing some nodding of heads. Um, so I, I gather some folk understand what I'm talking about. It'd be great if Iris could 
uh, I'm thinking about, about everybody else who's on the council, Iris, and um, sorry, I'm looking quickly, but not quickly enough uh, <laughs> to kind of give, give their take on it. Um, the other challenge we're just going to have is, you know, we've got the council has some big policy decisions to make. Um, we 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 we're not going to be meeting in person. I've not had like in depth, robust policy deliberations among dozens of people in a Zoom environment before. I don't know exactly what that is going to look like. Um, so, but it is it, again, it is what it is. Um, you know, we we're not going to have the time to, you know just do the kind of things that humans have done over millennia to, to just to confer with one another and see where we've got common ground. So, uh, so we're going to have that bit of a, maybe handicap is too strong a word, I, but it's, we're, we're definitely going to have some challenges around that, I think, or maybe not. I don't know. Maybe, maybe it'll be perfect. Um, but to me, it's a challenge because I can't even see all the people in a decision-making process on one screen. Um, it's just not like looking around a room. So, so I'm not knocking anything. It is, you know, we're just, we are where we are. Uh, a lot of the, the drafting has to be done by like November 2nd, November 9th. Um, and that's coming up fast. So that's where we are. <laughs> and feel free, anybody wanted to refute any of that, feel free to. <laughs> Thanks, Chris. I see no one wanting to refute you and other people nodding their heads. So that was helpful. Again, just helpful context, I think, is what we're looking at context for our conversation today. Like, what else is happening in the Climate Council right now that we should understand? Yeah, Kashka. So my first question is to David. Um, David, you had mentioned um, that the uh, the consultants were talking about the outreach efforts and that that has to um, kind of continue and perhaps take a um, you know more solid look as to how that's going to go forward um, from now on. And I was wondering if you could kind of expand on that as well, since I'm also working on outreach efforts and that'd be great to hear. Yeah, so thanks, Kashka. Uh, it's a work in progress, I would say, of the exact shape that takes after December 1st. Uh, there are some really interesting ideas on the table about how that engagement that happens around the initial plan after December 1st is oriented towards um, those who are going to take these ideas up and really try to implement them. So that could be the legislature or other bodies. So the idea would be, how do we having conversations around this initial plan that inform the people that then will take these ideas forward and try to make them a reality? The reason I say it that way is because we will make an initial plan on December 1st, and then it's not like we're gonna have a traditional public comment period and then a revised initial plan in February or March. That's not the way this process is structured. What will happen is that after an initial plan in December 1st, other bodies, whether it's the legislature, the administration, or other folks are gonna to need to take these things up and figure out how to implement them. And then the council itself can make a revised plan in the next year or so. So there's real opportunity to, to do good outreach after December 1st. And we just need to be straight up like, who's it going to and how does it change? How is it impactful? How is that meaningful engagement? So orienting towards, orienting towards the implementers feels like one pathway. There were some concerns brought up in the council that we really need to have a, a just transition and equity lens on whatever we do. And that means understanding like power structures and imbalances and all that. So there's some real thought that needs to go into that work after December 1st. They're, the consultants have additional time on their contract to do work after December 1st. Um, and it's not unlimited, but it's an amount of time. And so we do have that resource at our disposal so we can help orient them to what's the highest value use of their time. And then how you, Kashka and others, want to be part of a process to, to really push out this initial plan and get feedback that's meaningful in its implementation. Thanks, David. And um, you had mentioned, so after December 1st, though, it's not going to be super malleable. Am I correct in my assumption? The, 
the the initial climate action plan is not going to be malleable as an action as an initial action plan what is malleable is how it's implemented and also there can be relatively frequent updates the legislature requires that it's updated at least every four years i think or maybe five i'm not sure but the counselors have expressed interest in a much more frequent um, update cycle and so that could be a year or two years or whatever the council decides. That's up in the council's hands. Um, but the initial draft action plan won't have a lot of malleability on it, but it's gonna be a framework in which people need to implement. So there's a lot of work that needs to be done around implementation. Thank you. Okay, Beverly. So what I'm hearing is that when the plan is created by the committee after December 1st, that all the voices in the BIPOC community and marginalized communities that have not been heard won't have an opportunity to be heard. Is that what I'm hearing? So. The way I see it, Beverly, is that this having a just climate transition is a process, right? In December 1st is one milestone in that process. It's a milestone of having a framework, an initial, an initial climate action plan. And it gets us so far, but it really only gets us one little step in the road. And so there's a lot of work that needs to happen from December one on around what this really means in practice in terms of the implementation of it. And that's where there is enormous opportunity to do really thoughtful, equitable engagement with uh, frontline communities, communities of color, marginalized communities. There's a lot of opportunity and that opportunity can uh, affect the actual implementation of these ideas. So that's how I see it. The initial draft, or excuse me, the initial climate action plan, let me get the words right, uh, is what'll be presented on December 1st. And the council can update it as soon as it wants to. And there's a lot of work that needs to happen on the back end of that. And a lot of engagement that can be really powerful and affecting how implementation actually happens. Okay, so then the frontline communities will be a made will be made aware that their voices can continue to be heard as to how it's implemented even if it's not addressing what they feel is their are their needs because i i'm hearing from a lot of people that they have you know they have uh, zoomed in on on meetings and most of the meeting was um, held talking about what the climate action plan is and then being told the people who didn't get to speak were told oh well then you know put your questions in the chat mm -hmm. and for some people that was not satisfactory and so that you know that con that concerns me about you know, are, are people's voices really being heard? I know that, you know, there's some of us that have come and we have talked about what we see as the needs of, of these communities. But where are the voices of, of these communities in, the, in, this, in this document? How can we go back and say, well, on a meeting, you know, held on such and such a day, this was the overriding concern. Um, yeah, it's a real dilemma of how you make sure you are getting out and talking to a, that full range of voices and those voices find their way in directly into the debate and dialogue. Um, in this process, you know, I go back to what's happened. I don't want to be like, I don't want to speak to all the things because I'm, I have a particular role in this of facilitating, but I haven't been running sort of the public engagement part that the Climate Access and RISE have been doing a good job on. 
if you think back of where this all started, they did a round of diverse, you know, interviews with a really diverse group of folks back in June, May, June, July, uh, that helped inform their plan. They went out and tried to design a plan uh, in doing things across the state. They tried to do a very uh, a BIPOC affinity space event and managed to hold it despite some really difficult situations around that. And there are really powerful messages that came out from that affinity space uh, that were presented at council this week and are part of this process and needs to need to be really front and center in this process. And I think it's this speaks to me like how do we do this going forward in a way that feels really credible and legitimate for everybody involved. And it's tough on Zoom right to have some. It's like what Chris was saying, it's so tough to do this in a meaningful way remotely. And so how do we increasingly figure out a way to meet people where they are? Um, so I, I don't have a great answer, Beverly, but I think where you started with that is like transmitting to the full range of Vermonters, this process requires your voice and will include your voice going forward. And if it doesn't have it, we're probably gonna fall on our face in implementing it. Okay, yeah. thank you. Um, before I call on Chris, yeah, and thanks Beverly for lifting that up. I, it feels like this is a tension point that we saw like at the start of this process, right? That this timeline was just gonna really be challenging in terms of us being able to do the actual public engagement that we feel is so core to this work. So I just wanna, um, I want to lift that up just for like we, we knew it was and guess what it is and guess what we still have to keep trying to do it better, I think is like my own takeaway from that. Um, and Chris, is that an old hand or you got a new comment? Okay. Um, it, it's a new so, one. I just just oh, one thing ahead. I would just encourage you to do. I know we're getting to this later, but uh, you know, I don't know who all is, I don't know who all is testifying tomorrow, but this needs to come up. I mean, hopefully you'll get asked about it, but this needs to come up. Um, and frankly, this is a teachable moment also for the legislature, because there's this compete yeah. this, this repetitive pattern of there is this critical thing that must be done and it has to be done tomorrow, and we're not going to give you any time to get to do the public engagement or any resources to do that. But it's got to be done. It's got to be done. It's got to be done. And I, you know, part of what I've learned through this process is, you know, that's kind of a white privilege attitude of, you know, we assume everybody's going to get in line and have the resources to engage. We're going to get it done. We're going to get it done. And, um, you know, that's the way it always goes. And so um, I hope whoever is participating tomorrow, you know, in addition to talk about the Just Transitions principles, can also bring up, you know, legislature need to be mindful about what you're asking agencies, individuals, towns, organizations, whoever it is to, we need to give the time and space for the public engagement in this stuff. Um, and I, I, and I'm, I would imagine that when the initial plan is released on the first, um, uh, you know, I've mentioned this in full commission meetings, I think I mentioned it here, I have every, every assumption that it's going to just get ripped apart. Um, mm -hmm. It is just going to get hammered from all sides. People would feel like it did too much. People who feel like it didn't do enough, um, but that's okay. This is going to be an iterative process. This is the beginning; it's not the end. And you know, we're de we're dealing with fundamental changes to how we deal with everything, from energy to mobility to land use, and all the decisions related to that. You can't pull that off in a year. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks, Chris, and a good reminder to lift this up tomorrow with the legislature and um, Iris. Yeah, um, I might have missed this, but I, Jane, can you talk about what happened to the March 1st deadline? Because I did not hear that in that piece about the initial plan. I think David was just speaking in vagaries. I don't think anything's changed. I think that we missed an opportunity, to be honest, a bit at the meeting on Tuesday with the council to get clarity around what is going to happen between December 1st and March 1st. Um, but we've been talking and we will do engagement over the winter. And it's a question of how we fold that in. But I don't think anything's changed with the March, the idea that we could 
use that feedback to consider revisions to the climate action plan um, as soon as March. Okay, so th there's still plans to change, ha have that be a second de deadline and have changes be made based on public engagement? The question has, I mean, yes. I think that we need extreme clarity at this point, though, in order to go back out for public engagement on what we're really doing over the winter. And um, I think that we have not said that as a council. We have present, I have presented that, but the council has not said they are revising the plan March 1st. And that's where I'm starting to try to ask people what their intent is with the public engagement. Um, and I'm not getting a clear picture yet. The bottom line is that many of the actions are going to be taken up by the legislature. And it's almost a challenge to think about what the council then does, right? There's these buckets, there's these swim lanes, essentially, of where the work's going to go, right? There's the legislative process, there's rulemaking, there's um, personal action, there's the other stakeholders, and then there's work that the council itself is still going to be doing around the RFI, the RFPs still working towards future knowledge base for future iterations of the plan. And I think that those understanding where influence can be made, where we engage with um, the public to understand that they have influence for us to, uh, to shape the thinking at the council level around personal action, around all of that. But what's happening in the legislature, it's almost like a call to action to say, you know, these are moving in the legislature. These are ideas you need to engage, and these are the ways you can do it. Um, but I, I'm understanding that it is not our job to then take the feedback and tell the legislature what to do with it. That we have to help people understand that they need to activate and how to engage with the legislature around those components. And similar for rulemaking, I would expect. Although I don't think many of the actions in the climate action plan there's only a few that we can see that will go to rulemaking, if any, okay. because of lack of specificity. But I fully support like in being clear and authentic with what we do with the engagement to ensure that what we're getting um, folds into future iterations. Hope that could be March. Sarah, you're muted. Muted. Okay. Yeah, thanks, Jane. I think that's right. I think you talking through that illuminates how complex it becomes, even if the in, intent is that we, the Climate Council itself go out to more robust engagement, make revisions for March 1st. We've already got the legislature starting to take action. We've already got rulemaking starting to get initiated. And so the question then becomes um, focal points for that public engagement, like where how is that information feeding into actually influence change and what's the role of the climate council in that? So that's actually a great thing for us to even start to talk about later in our conversation today as we think about um, just transitions and equity and implementation is also like the role of ongoing public engagement. So I just want to name that as something we can come back to. Um, so, and then Sue, you had your hand up, but you're also traveling. Did you want to add anything? Can you hear me? Yes. I'm so sorry. I've been really cut in and out, but I caught the last few minutes and I definitely caught Chris talking about the legislature. So um, I do uh, fully anticipate that in addition to the guiding principles, we will ask members um, who have stepped forward to, to testify about how they're feeling about all this, because I fully agree this is an, a, a very teachable moment um, and that's why I think the legislature wants to hear from us. So I won't, um, I don't want to spend more time on it because I think we might talk later, but I did just want to weigh in on that quickly. Thanks. I'm Sarah, muted again. You're muted. Oh no, I'm muted again. Okay. Uh, <laughs> um, I really love that this group just wants to get into meat of it tonight. That's really great. So I'm gonna keep us moving along um, and invite Jane or David, either one of you, to just give like a very brief overview around sort of how the decision making process is working through the Climate Council right now in terms of 
prioritization, just what are those steps in the process in terms of how something's actually ending up in the plan? I just want to make sure our subcommittee all shares that clarity. Sure. So I'm happy to do that. Um, I'm, my assumption is, as we discussed ahead of this, is that we were going to talk a little bit about um, how act, how actions are being prioritized for the climate action plan. Only, and the only reason I ask and clarify that is because we have another thing that David has been helping support the steering committee and ultimately the council on, which is the decision making model um, around how um, decisions will be made for around what happens when consensus can't be reached. Um, both at subcommittees and council. So that, that's also a document that I encourage folks to look at because it does um, empower all subcommittee members specifically. That was a change that was made um, rather than just council members to lift up the council members on the subcommittees. Um, the way the process roadmap was set out had sort of the power if consensus wasn't reached to advance work from subcommittees and that was changed to be that all subcommittee members had a voting voice um, in order to determine what work is elevated to the council. Um, so briefly, um, mindful of time and Kai is joining us. I, there, we, I have four slides and I'll drop it in the chat so folks can look at it that I've used in the past to speak to prioritization. Um, but I think what the most important component for people to understand is how the guiding principles and the scoring rubric fit into that. Um, we've been speaking to um, five foundational criteria of which um, justice and equity um, are core to how we lift up and elevate actions. We've also been trying to name and define um, the other four which speak to the impact of actions towards um, building resilience and sequestration on the landscape, as well as helping um, uh, meet emissions reductions, technical feasibility and cost effectiveness, which are spelled out explicitly in the GWSA um, around how actions will be lifted up and recommendations, they'll be cost effective and technically feasible, um, which for most actions, everything's technically feasible that people are putting forward. So it's just sort of a checking of the box. Um, and then um, finally, co-benefits and both cost effectiveness and co-benefits in the criteria also speak to equity um, so that equity is not only um, its own pie in the chart with the scoring rubric, but we're also trying to get at it through the other criteria. And that was important because we chose to implement um, prioritization in a stepwise approach in that rather than reviewing all five of those definitions, and considering if an action ranked high, medium, or low in any of those spaces to get to overall a high or um, priority action to be included in the cap. We didn't want to um, exclude equity because we also felt like to do justice to the scoring rubric, we needed to start to realize what actions were going to lift up into the climate action plan since some subcommittees um, had so many actions that it felt hard to get the detail and specificity that we really needed to make it an actionable plan. So prioritization was done looking at impact, cost effectiveness, co-benefits, and then technical feasibility to prioritize what um, actions would make it from um, the full suite of actions being considered into what would be written up in the body of the climate action plan. So as a reminder, all pathways and strategies coming out of subcommittees were automatically going into the body of the cap. And it's underneath those strategies, how many actions we were going to be able to speak to. And then it's beholden on the subcommittees to speak to the actions um, ability and putting forward equitable solutions its impact on meeting the requirements of the GWSA, what co-benefits it brings um, into the space, its feasibility um, so that every action has that component spoken to as it comes into the body of the cap. Once we've um, prioritized those actions and it's really been in, an attempt to be a guide because um, we didn't say only high priority actions carry into the cap. We also gave subcommittees the discretion to lift up priorities that were only um, ranked overall as medium and low based on um, equity concerns were explicitly called out as a reason to lift up a solution if it wasn't the highest impact emissions reduction um, component um, or other reasons that might make it a compelling action to bring forward um, if the uh, subcommittee needed to reach consensus around those actions. Based on that final suite of actions, um, those actions have come back to the subcommittees 
and Kaya, um, and Kaya can speak more to this in the challenges um, still associated with this uh, approach, has been the interest was to um, review all of those actions against the scoring rubric um, in order to ensure that the guiding principles um, and then the scoring rubric were applied to all actions that were coming into the body of the climate action. I think we're starting to see some challenges with that um, approach, and we're going to talk about that with the council on Tuesday. And I'm hopeful that this conversation will help inform um, how we think about that with the council on Tuesday, because um, even after prioritization, um, one example, and Iris can probably give the number better than me, but there's still 80 actions for ag and eco, like is one example that are coming into the body of the climate action plan. So, and the time at this point is so compressed that can you actually do the scoring rubric on all of those actions? And if you can't, what is the expectation that we will do um, for, before any of these actions actually hit the road, um, so to speak? So what does implementation look like with the scoring rubric, with the equity? As we know, we're not gonna be able to, do, to go through the scoring rubric with all of these actions, nor in many cases, and with cross-sector, this was really um, uh, illuminating, was so that the, in the emissions reduction space, those are things that we've been working on for years, and we still didn't have enough details to really get to a score. And many of the things in the other subcommittees will have a challenge with that too. So prioritization um, is, is supposed to be a guide, but we're still um, struggling with sort of the, the breadth and depth of what we are actually carrying into the climate action plan and the reality of the timeline is grueling, to be honest. So I look. I, I would like. I'll end with that and answer any questions. But really want Kaya to go into the details of how it's working with the subcommittees and um, the challenges there, and lean into all of you uh, for ideas and solutions. Okay, great. Thanks, Jane. I think that was. And and I think you said you were going to share like a link to a couple of slides. So for those of us more visually inclined, know that that will be helpful. Um, and any questions for Jane, just about sort of how that's flowing so people kind of understand that process that's happening? Yeah, Kashka. Um, first of all, thank you, Jane, so much. That just seems so absolutely overwhelming and it's just so much and so little time. Again, like we have so little time. It's so frustrating for me because it just seems like it's it's so rushed. Um, but just having said that, it just, I don't know, it just kind of bothers me to know that like the rubric is, some of the things that they're, you know, we're just unable to use the rubric or we're, we're really unable to, to um, put forth these incredible pieces of guidelines and of, um, self-reflection or reflection upon like whatever we're doing into, into, into everything. And I understand it's difficult and I understand it's probably nearly impossible in some cases, but I just, it's just really frustrating for me because, you know, I, I guess it's just frustrating for me on, on several different points. I guess the, um, the intense rush of everything is, is one thing. Um, and the inability to, say we've really you know reached the voices of say 80 percent of Vermont or um you know it, it's just it's really it's just difficult for me to swallow um but I do I do appreciate I do appreciate all the efforts so I yeah I, I guess it's yeah thank you yeah no thanks and I just want to again Remind us all that Jane didn't create this December 1st deadline, which I know everyone appreciates, but the legislature gave that to us and it's it's not really movable for us. So I think we're all feeling that and thank you for expressing that, Kashka. And um, and our, you know, we, we uh, oh, Beverly, I'll, Beverly's got her hand up, so I'll let Beverly jump in. And then let's switch to hearing from Kaya about how we are using the tool and the assessment questions. And let's get into that because it's not like it's being tossed to the side either, right? So let's Beverly, why don't you go ahead? Yeah, I just wanted to make the comment that, you know, this this rush, 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 and the deadline that was set by the legislature is another way that the system silences the voices of frontline communities. 
frontline communities, yeah. we we can't work in this rushed, rushed um, environment. Um, some of some of the frontline communities have trouble just making it from month to month. And so adding this in, asking them to think about this does take time. And I, I feel like this deadline that has been imposed upon us, I realize Jane didn't set it, but I think that it is just, um, it, it's, it's another way that they can say, well, we reached out and we didn't get it. So I guess they don't care, which is not true. But I, ju I just have to say that. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Beverly. And I, uh, I let's continue to lift that up that um, I think in no way do we want it to be reflected in the climate action plan that we did enough public engagement. That, that we did enough that we really heard all the voices that needed to be heard before December 1st. Absolutely. And uh, I appreciate you lifting that up. And frankly, I'm not sure that the rush rush is helpful for any of us. <laughs> um, and uh, uh, Sarah, um, can you? Yeah, Mona, is, are you trying yes, to- Yes, can you again? please, can you please read the, um, the notes that I, I, I wrote down uh, because I did not get also an answer for what, uh, for the questions I asked. Sure. Thank you. Yeah, I'm not doing a good job with the chat box. And I encourage you, Mona, do you want to just share your, your, your comment? Can you just share it? Just, you know, I wrote it down because first of all, I have an accent and okay. some of you, I feel like, you know, don't have the patience to, <laughs> you know, for me. So I wrote, I like to, to write, you know, it's Got probably, it. it's more easy, it's more easier to understand. You know, um, my question is, I have been attending almost this, almost six meetings now or more, and I did not see, you know, uh, any outreach for any of my, our communities. You know, I did not see uh, one single translated document of any of your action plan. I don't really know what is this climate action plan. You know, we should, we, so should these people be a part of putting this action plan? Should you, ha you need to hear their voice? Maybe they will have some, you know, uh, changes that need to be made. Uh, uh, one more action plan that need to be added to your action plan. You know, they need to have a voice. So I am not sure, you know, like maybe I am missing the point. You know, I am one of the public. I, I'm just trying, you know, to, to help my community understand, but I need to be able to understand myself first. I can help them. But I really, since I attended th these meetings, I feel like I'm lost, you know, I don't, I, I was like, you know, um, I, I hoped from the beginning, you know, listening to me when I said, you need to reach out to the people that they are really working with these diverse communities. And I go and I check and the ALV, I, I said, did anybody contacted you regarding reach out? Did anybody send a document to translate about this action plan or this, you know, of, or about this climate change? And the, I don't see any anything, so I am not sure. You know what is what is action plan from the beginning? Thanks, Mona. Yeah, I I think that's really fair. I think see Jane's raising her hand. Who can maybe answer that? Yeah, some of that anyway. Speak to it. Thanks. I I do just I want to appreciate that, Mona, and thank you for raising it. And um, I do just want to say that one of the things that the the timeline presented a real challenge for, and that we hope to do with this next phase of engagement over the winter is partner support. And with our contractors, we have the ability to, to work with um, organizations and partners embedded in frontline and impacted communities in order to lift up and go to them and support them in helping us communicate the work of the Climate Action Plan. Um, and it was one of the most challenging components that we weren't able to do that this fall because it was it was just not enough time, and um, I w admit that that is that was a real failing on the timeline that it presented us, and it's something that our partners spoke to and the need to do, and um, continue to think about how we can do that better um, this winter. And I and just as far as translation, um, I it was we it is not to our lack of trying. Um, we were it, all of our events 
um, had the ability to have translation services provided at them. The online events in particular asked me to ask of asking if you needed that those kinds of services and what language. We never had anybody ask, but we do have um, on contract a plan to um, translate the climate action plan itself into um, I guess nine languages that's within the contract. So um, we are thinking about that, but are open to learning from others, especially on the subcommittee of how we can do better in that space. Okay. Um, thank you. Thank you, Mona. And thank you for not just writing in the chat. Thank you for adding your voice to the dialogue as well. I think that's important. Thank you. Um, Kashka, and then we've really got to move along, folks. Yep, go ahead. Sorry, I, I don't mean to take up any more time. Um, I just wanted to uh, speak to what Mona had said, and I can really appreciate what she's saying. Um, but I, I, I was, I was completely lost. And I know that you guys are in it. You, you know, you're, you're all a part of it, but coming in somebody from the outside, it's just, there's just so much. And it's just the zoom, the not knowing all these different uh, facets. It's just, it's really, it's really confusing. And then having a language barrier on top of it and all those other things, it's just, it's, it's really frustratingly and maddingly confusing. Um, what I did want to say to Mona is that this action plan the um, that that is going to be coming out on December 1st. So that's what David was speaking to um, uh, before. The action plan will come out on December 1st, but then we will reach out to as many communities and we need your help, Mona. We need the help of everybody to help reach out to low and moderate income Vermonters from every community so that then we will be able to look at the action plan what's in, once it's in place and say, okay, so these are the things that need to get done. Number one, this is going to get done. Number two, this is gonna get done. But then we can say, well, how is that going to get done so that it doesn't negatively impact those who are typically negative, negatively impacted by, by such policies. So that's when we're going to come in and really do um, the outreach efforts. And we're going to need your help, Mona, and we're going to need the help of all kinds of community members to do that. So thanks so much. And I'm sorry for taking up so much time. Okay. Yeah, no, that's great. Thank you. And um, just really want to recognize folks, I, I, I failed as a facilitator in honoring the time on our agenda, but that's actually really important because people come to our meetings based on those times. So I, not to cut off important conversation, we can come back to it later. But Kaya, can you jump in to just provide us an update around how, how the work is going right now? That'd be great. Thank you. For sure. I think there's a few things I need to say in advance of this though. So one, oh, what just happened? I don't know why. Um, Okay, things are going down on my video. Sorry about that. If I don't look clear, um, that's <laughs> yeah. hopefully it figured itself out. No, I still look like I'm hanging out on a holo hologram. You're <laughs> fine. You're fine. <laughs> Okay, good, good. Okay, so um, what I wanted to be able to share with you all today um, that I think is super important for this piece, um, as we're talking about what that means for community engagement, as this talks about bringing in voices of those most impacted and asking for people to wait their turn to have their voices in, that's what I've experienced in this. Um, one of the, just in this very meeting right here. So this entire conversation, I had many things I could have been contributing to that would have helped clarify some information, give some different insights, give you a, a wealth of what I've been holding. Um, and I only say this with an urgency because I'm being targeted for doing this work. And so like in this space, having to wait my turn to speak felt particularly harmful for me in this moment, because as many of you are, we're holding so much and our hearts and souls are into this and you've put in unpaid labor that is far beyond the scope of what you were asked to do initially in order to try to make this right. So it is difficult to swallow hearing the challenges. And I don't want you to swallow hearing the challenges as this is the best we can do. This is what it is. So 
understanding that what happens with the scoring rubric and where it is been in a really illuminating process is that I'm taking the different subcommittees through the process of looking at their prioritization prioritized actions that they want to move forward and again as Jane said these are ones to really utilize the tool best they have to have a further depth of description and vision and a potential strategy now while there may be some actual policy language that might come into the cap all of it feels um, there's a certain level of arrogance that we're doing so in creating this because there shouldn't be anything in the cap that is ready to go because we do not have the public engagement that we need that would really or even an ability to do the analysis on the engagement that was given. So while Climate Access and RISE did the best they could to summarize this, we know that there have been community groups, there have been researchers, there have been organizations that have been submitting documentation. And it is an impossible task to ask these consultants to somehow tease out those different pieces, highlight them and make sure they get back to the communities, I mean, to the committees so that they can infuse them into their proposals. It cannot happen. And so if this plan goes forward and hits the ground running in January, when the legislature is going to take off, their work as they do will focus on those that have the most detail and not the ones that are still visions yet to be realized. And that is problematic on multiple levels because even the most detailed of plans do not have the hopes, the dreams, the demands, and the visions of people involved. So this is something I'm saying this, and I'm giving you this speech and this preamble. It's the same one I'm saying in every space I'm in. The number one piece the public needs from us with this cap is to be as transparent as possible. Be unflinching in the critique about what this timeline has done. It hasn't just made it frustrating. It has created actual harm, significant emotional harm, not just for the people in this, on the council and on the subcommittees, but as well as members of the public who are sitting here feeling like, I went to your session on agriculture, but what the hell was that? And we came here to this BIPOC space. There are no youth here. There's nobody here. We could organize around this, but there's no time to organize around this. And even if they did organize around it and gave a glorious 50 page report on what that said, when, where, and how is that going to get baked into this work? It's not. So we're going to be asking a group that is so task oriented, like the legislature, to take this and to push forth policy and once a policy is introduced it is a living breathing thing and it once it takes off it takes off so this is going to be super duper hard and i do not place this on your shoulders the only ask i have is that we are as clear as we can possibly be about what it is we're doing so the rubric in itself is actually a really helpful tool. The guiding principles are crucial in guiding the thinking. And what the rubric is showing are things that we don't know. It's demanding questions that we're not ready to answer. And I don't believe that any equity screen will be done by December 1st or even March 1st. Because if we do it right, it's probably going to take a year because we need to be engaging more university partners, more folks that are working in communities that also have subject matter expertise in ways that we might not have thought of. For example, even thinking about electric vehicles, and I know this is something I've talked about with Sue and I've talked about with some other folks. Have you talked with the finance managers at some of these dealerships? Because they have really smart ideas around how to think about special financing. That's a subject matter expertise that is 100% not in the room. You know what else is not in the room? Small car dealerships. Your little small uh, mom and pops that are also ones providing low cost vehicles to people in our communities. And then, and then, and then, right? But so if we're going to really tease it out and say we did this and we know we can like put our names on it, we're like, we did the dang thing. It's not happening by December 1st. It's not happening by March 1st. And be clear about it and make it a put out. That's your bat signal. Okay. We couldn't answer these questions. We didn't have the answers to these questions and we want to know them and we need help. 
that's how you do these sorts of reports is you don't make promises you can't keep and you don't say things that aren't true, nor do you stay silent on them. But you're just speaking from the heart, from the truth. And it doesn't mean that you're not going to meet those the pieces, that, that carrot and that stick of that litigation that you're trying to bang over people's heads saying that the groups are going to come and sue them. Right? Okay? I'm already worried about getting sued personally for the BIPOC session that we held because it was all my fault. And that is also a tactic that these folks are using right now in multiple spaces. I got plenty of colleagues that can tell you about frivolous lawsuits coming against them for doing this very type of work. So this is going to get scrutinized so freaking hard. And then we have this whole other piece of strategic racism, strategic ableism, and all these things that are going to impact the way that this lands. So this is the moment to really get real. So yeah, when you go on Friday, you can tell them that Kaya was super salty. Okay, <laughs> let them know I'm coming for them. Okay, so this is important to know. So it is a helpful tool, but I don't know with true fidelity how deep we'll be able to do. I think some groups and some proposals will be able to get much further through it, but that doesn't mean that it still doesn't have to go through a broader analysis from y'all and from the public to say, did they get it right? That still has to happen too. So um, those pieces that are, you know, litigious <laughs> that have to do with reducing the emissions, those are gonna, they'll, you, you will have met those, you're gonna meet it because you're gonna put forth the plan. Is it the right, the complete and the best plan? Mm -mm. And you can say that, <laughs> okay? So um, we're gonna continue to work through these processes. So each of the committees, as we said, some of them have multiple actions and some of those actions might not even be held in that committee. They might be held in the work of a different proposal. Some of these actions are important ideas and concepts, but they're not full on proposals yet. So it's going to be a really difficult place of trying to see where these worlds come together so that as they are putting forth these top actions, they will be able to say, we did not leave out someone in what we were trying to do. We did not forget about living beings in other ways other than just thinking about humans, right? That we were able to do that. But it is going to require for them to say at a minimum, in some cases, by December 1st even, that we still have so much more work to do to do this right, because we don't want it to be an insult to the populace who's expecting this work from us. Um, and I know that that's so hard, because I know y'all are burnt out, and this council's got an appointment for three years. <laughs> so um, that feels like forever. It feels truly like forever, but it's time for you to get the help you need. It's time for you to throw up the bat signal and to ask other people to step into this work. And we just haven't had that time up to this point, but now's the point to declare it. And still use the scoring rubric and the principles as a way to say, if you are gonna move towards finding a, a tool for implementation, finding a path towards implementation of these ideas, this is what we expect. So if you don't have the answers in your implementation plan that we didn't have here on the scoring rubric, then maybe we should talk. Maybe we should talk about it. So um, that probably wasn't what you were expecting me to say, <laughs> but it is what's weighing on my heart and mind. And it is the approach that I'm trying to take with folks because you all are holding too much in trying to imagine that you're gonna solve all the things. And as an equity consultant, I can't say that you're not trying. That's not what I'm saying. And I'm not saying that you're not bleeding from your fingers, trying. But what I do need to be able to say at the end of this is, this work is not yet finished, and this is not of their doing. So, um, there you go. <laughs> I guess questions. Thanks, Kaya. No, thank you so much. Um, I think as always sort of helping, helping us all to pop open what a lot of us are feeling in our hearts, so thank you. Um, questions for Kaya while we still have her? Questions about some of what she said or questions about the work she's doing with the subcommittees right now, anything? Can we ask the legislature to move the date? Can we just do it? Kashka, to change the dates that are in the legislation. Um, do we have to have it by December 1? Do we, what, like, why? Yeah, 
I don't think it's the legislature is not in session right now, so I'm not sure it's possible to have them change a December 1st deadline. But but there are other deadlines in the in the act itself. Um, it could be moved. Can you hear me? This is Sue. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, Sue. Go ahead. Sorry, I've been in and out. Uh, just specifically to Kashka, you know, tomorrow we're speaking to a committee of the legislature while the legislature is out of session. Um, I don't think there is a chance. change I know there's not a chance to change statute um, you know, we certainly all right I'm gonna cut you off as entertaining as that is you can't hear us either oh my gosh. Okay, somebody has muted her. Um, I'm sorry, Sue, that was hard to hear you, I think, even though you sounded like a... And why is it still coming through? How is that even possible? The six million dollar woman. <laughs> <laughs> if you caught the slow motion of her voice, I think she was saying that the opportunity to change the December 1st deadline just may not be there, I think, is weighing in on that. Um, Abby, go ahead. I know, I feel so badly that Sue's still trying to connect. Um, Kaya, I have a question. Since you are connecting with the various subcommittees on kind of your recommended process, so... I always feel like we can spend all this time saying what about what's not working, but maybe what our recommendation is of what would work best or better. And so I'm just curious, as you're meeting with subcommittees, do you think this approach of connecting at the subcommittee level and maybe having the, the part of prioritization? Like are those facts that we feel and the frustrations. Uh, it could be that we influence. Wow. I don't know if Sue's still talking. You are asking Abby around like, so what am I recommending? I'm recommend, are, what are the things that we can move forward on? I'm saying keep going with the work and get as far as you can. Um, I think that there are, again, like I said, just going through the process is really important. There's been a What's positive about um, the way that it's structured is because the questions that the guiding questions that were placed within this right that was given opportunity to start identifying what's needed and I've asked each of the subcommittees and the task leads for those areas to go through it and start thinking about it where would you where would you pull that data how would you go about starting to determine if you've captured who are all of the impacted communities or um, what the effects are for certain sectors and if this does what this does for creating jobs those sorts of things mm -hmm. so it's giving people a place to start saying have we actually answered those and in some cases they may have and others they may not have gone far enough yet and so that's part of what i'm doing through this facilitation is also trying to help them push a little bit further right in their thinking then what the scoring rubric itself does is it gives people a chance a chance to kind of say okay now that we're looking at those answers there what's our gut feeling as to um how ready this particular part is Should, are, is there more that we need to do do we feel like we still don't we have unanswered questions and it just gives them sort of a barometer to keep using it and working in that way so it's not the expectation that the work won't happen um how subcommittees that have multiple actions are going to you know that may not be lifted up as immediate priorities for this first iteration of the plan how they will speak to those other actions um that's something that the group is still going to want to go through and that's a little bit beyond kind of what i'll be doing <laughs> but um it is also just encouraging them again to think through what do you hold what is held perhaps by a different proposal um or how do you want to speak to um, lifting up that these are other ideas, um, because that would probably be the best course of action at this stage, especially in the biennium. So I don't know if that helps answer 
your question, Abby, or if there's more that you're thinking around that. Yeah, no, that's helpful. I, I just wanted to make sure that as you're starting the conversations, you still feel like we have the right tools. Maybe we need more time and we need longer process, but that we have the right resources we just need their year, you know, whatever mm -hmm. amount of time. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. So um, wait, so just to make sure so you're asking whether or not I feel like the scoring rubric and the principles work like that, that practice is still a useful one for the group for the work of the groups. It, I, or... I guess my question is more about like is working with each subcommittee to go through their draft actions with the rubric and the guiding principles as part of a prioritization process that that approach is working even if some of the recommended or some of the actions are lacking specificity. So it may be that we mm -hmm. have to go back as a subcommittee and build mm -hmm. in more specificity to some of the actions and then mm -hmm. go back through with the rubric to identify which ones are meeting the expectation, which ones are not. And that may not, I think maybe there's like this initial review now and then maybe likely a follow-up review at a later time. It will be that case. It will be that case for some groups um, and definitely for the proposals that are not. Um, there's some that, again, um, as Jane was saying and as I was saying, again, don't have enough specificity for us to answer those. It could be a great visioning process, right? Um, but it's not ready for us to tease it out, perhaps in the cap. There is additional work happening outside of the subcommittee meetings. So again, it's just more labor on top of labor. Um, and it would be a lighter load if they had the support of community groups and, you know, researchers and other folks who could get in and like start pulling out whatever you're needing. You're just asking for this wish list and you're building out this house. So um, it would be great. I mean, my ideal community engagement would be, well, if we had had the proposals like better vetted through community process, if that had happened, then being able to take the results of this equity process and screening back to communities to say, did we get it right? Mm -hmm. Is there something we're still missing here when we're thinking about it? That would be lovely. That's definitely not happening by December 1st, so, <laughs> but it could happen in the future. So I, I do have hope for the process. There's just clear frustrations that obviously I'm holding and y'all are holding that um, are putting a little extra bite into my voice around this. So I think it has been helpful as well. Um, we've switched, I'm sorry, I guess just another little process thing on how we were doing this. So in the first iteration of running this through with the whole committees, we did one action all together as a group, then broke folks out into um, breakout groups where they each did two additional actions. None of them were gonna be completed by the time that we were done. Like that's just not a possibility, but it's to get people um, familiar with doing that process and using that process. Um, it worked well for one breakout group, another breakout group, folks just needed to pontificate and show slides. So it didn't necessarily happen as well. So um, and then there really wasn't a chance for the groups to hear across each other that that was necessary. So that's changing for tomorrow. And I think that's also important for the trust that's necessary in those two committees and themselves who've had their own tensions as they've been working through equity all the time um, to feel like all voices are going to be heard and that everyone has an opportunity to have questions about that and um, participate in that process. So we'll see how that goes. I'm feeling a little nervous about the time that we'll have to do this, but um, but this is what they have requested. So we're gonna do our best. Um, so. Thank you. Great, thanks, Kaya. Other thanks for question to Abby, just going a little bit deeper into the process there. That's helpful. Other questions for Kaya? given us a lot to chew on as we sort of think about uh, equity and just transitions and implementation, sort of like the what's next piece. So thank you. Set us up nicely for that conversation. Okay. All right. Well, then I want to honor that uh, you, you have stayed uh, 20 minutes past when we meant to have you. So thank you, Kaya, for that, for your willingness to do that. Thank you. Thank you so much. I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your meeting and it's good to see you all. And I'm here as a support. If you need me further, reach out to Jane. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Of course, you're welcome to stay, but I know you have to go. Um, so I'm going to keep us going a little bit, um, knowing that we have said we're going to pause at 535 for public comment. Um, so we have 20 minutes to sort of get into this.
conversation, or really go back to this conversation that we started last time. Um, and then uh, from there, oh, have we lost too many members? Uh, one, two, three, four, five. Okay, all right, we'll keep going then. Maybe it's just the way I have my screen set up then. Um, okay. So, oh, I see. Great. Sorry. For a second there, I thought we lost quorum, and I just, in terms of process, wanted to pause for a second. Apologies. Uh, okay. So, um, I am going to share my screen so that we can kind of review what it is we're talking about and how we, how we got here, um, or what we've talked about so far. Can I share my screen? Sure. One second. Ah. Oh, I'm not sharing. Now I'm sharing. Okay. So this is, oh, okay. Screen sharing. You're not my friend. Okay. So the question is, so there is a section of the, just to remind folks, there's a section of the uh, plan that is really, that is called, um, or the title of the section that we're supposed to work on is about uh, just transitions and equity considerations in implementation, right? Sort of the like after December 1st, what else should we be doing? So we, not just our subcommittee, but sort of the Climate Council as a whole in this work, what does that look like? Um, and just want to, um, and some of the notes here that are from our last conversation, so just maybe can quickly review those together. Um, and then I've also just even from the conversation tonight put in a couple, a couple key thoughts. Um, so maybe let's start with just reviewing what's here. Sorry, I'll make this a little bit bigger. Um, so just kind of, um, you know, really naming the inability to do the robust equity analysis analysis that's truly needed, um, the robust public engagement, if we want to expand that, means that the plan lacks some of the completeness that's needed and we should name the ongoing work that's required, right? So that's sort of what, what this section of the plan, I think, is meant to do, is to name the ongoing work that's required. Um, keep going as far as we can. Um, this, uh, the use of the assessment questions in the rubric as a requirement during implementation, like continuing the process of going back to those, um, a process that allows for going back to communities. Uh, so engagement that's not um, just one time, but that's more dialogue. Recognizing, of course, that we haven't even done some of that one, some of that initial engagement with, with some communities. Um, a hope, this is a piece that we, so those are kind of things that are coming up tonight. Um, a hope that guiding principles and, a, and the rubric have a life beyond the actual climate action plan. And, and we talked about this a little bit last time, supporting the use of those in other efforts within government. Um, so for instance, uh, um, considering that it could be adopted by ANR, that it could be used for other projects or policy development, that it could be used in the legislative process. Um, and budget or policy development. And I think a uh, piece here is, um, you know, we already have in, uh, within the executive branch anyway, we use this equity um, analysis tool that uh, was brought to us, a racial equity analysis tool that um, grew out of the work that our uh, Vermont's racial equity director has done. And so maybe we could go to her and loop back to her and think about how, um, how these pieces get integrated. Um, uh, and then I think so. Another piece that came up.